This morning we're looking at the attributes of God. The attributes of God. There is a lot to be said when we study the attributes of God. And to think that we would be able to cover them all would be foolish. If we thought that we would be able to um, speak of everything that God really is, we would uh, have a very hard time. But a study of the nature of God can never be complete or exclusively or exhaustively um, complete. We, we can never cover every area of it. The magnitude of his mercies, the grandeur of his grace, the totality of his truth, and the power of his presence cause us to realize our own limitations. You know, when I look at myself in the morning in the mirror, I am reminded of a lot of my own limitations. When I get working at my job, I'm reminded of a lot of my own limitations. It's amazing as you get older how your brain doesn't get older in the ideas of what you can do, but your body reminds you that you are limited. And all of a sudden you're not able to do the things that you used to do. You know, I've been doing some remodeling at the house, and I remember years ago I used to be a Finnish carpenter, and I would get in there and down on my knees and putting trim in and everything else, and I'd do it 8, 10, 12 hours a day and have no problems. I'd go home that night and I was fine. Now I do it for a couple hours and I am stiff for three days. It is amazing how we bring on the limitations of ourselves. As great as God is, however, he loves us so much that he wants to dwell in our hearts. And we need to remember this. You know, last week or the week before, I said, you know, a lot of times we consider ourselves to be like an ant and God is like our size. And I said how that is, your, your perspective is way off because God is so much greater than that. God is everywhere, infilling everything. And we need to remember that, and we'll be covering that this morning. The all-powerful, all-knowing God who created the worlds and fills the space loves us greatly and desires to dwell in our hearts. And when we begin to comprehend this, then we begin to understand exactly who God is. You know, we, we can get so hung up in this world. We get so hung up in the things of this world. We get so hung up in the ideas of this world and, and the needs that we think are needs of this world. That we sometimes and many times miss out on just who God is and what God wants to do in our hearts. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 says... For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. God has given us so many things so freely. You know, and... I, I know my thoughts and my ideas and why I do what I do. You know, my wife knows some of the, my thoughts and ideas. And when I start to do certain things, she's like, oh, okay, he's getting ready to do this or that. Or he's about ready to say this or that. But in all reality, I'm the only one that really knows what's going on down inside of here. And what's going on up in here. We, as... You know, the, the longer, if you're married, the longer you're married, you know, you, you get to that point, you look across the room, you look your wife in the eye, or you look your husband in the eye, and you begin to realize what's, you know, what they're thinking. But I'm the only one that really knows what's going on in here, except for God. God knows all about me. But when we take a look at what we are, we need to understand that it is God that gives us 
the direction, and the Spirit of God that gives us true life. All right, Psalms chapter 139, verses 1 through 10. And I did not realize this morning, and I'm going to try to stay off rabbit trails, you know, when you're studying and stuff, you don't realize how many scriptures you're putting down. And then I'm sending them to Sister Ginger, and the list is like this long. So I've got to try to, to go through these quickly, but... Um, so just bear with me. Psalms 139, verses 1 through 10. For the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? As I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Amen. You know, God is everywhere, and God knows all things. And we need to realize this, just as the oceans of this earth, which cover nearly 70% of this globe that we call earth, 70% of it, of, of that only, it's only estimated that 5% to 7% of their ocean floors have been examined. When you begin to realize how much has not been examined, you begin to realize how great the oceans are. And, and really, the, the depth at which we have examined is only like 500 and some feet deep at the most. Some areas have gone deeper, but very few. We as Christians have experienced only a small amount of what God has in store for us. Just like they have, st have studied only such a small amount of the ocean floor, you and I, when we get into the Word of God, we have only gotten into the, scratch the surface of what God has for us. We need to realize that God has so much for us. There are areas in the Spirit still waiting for you and I to explore. I've told this story before. When I was in Bible college, I remember going, and I'll do Reader's Digest version, going into the class of Brother S.G. Norris, who had founded this Bible college. I think the college was, I, I want to say, the 50th year when I was there. If not, it was way up there. And I remember this man sitting there just weeping when we walked into the class that morning. The long story short, what it ended up being was, as he was reading his scripture that morning before teaching the class, God opened something new to his heart and to his mind. You see, the scripture says it's new and fresh every day. And we need to look at it. It's living and it ought to be living inside of each and every one of us. There are, must be greater depths of suffering for Christ we have never endured. There must be spiritual realms of power and knowledge that we have never experienced. The Holy Ghost will guide us as we follow after Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Paul seemed overwhelmed by the unfathomable mercies and grace of the almighty God. Amen. And we need to realize that. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33 says... Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen. Clearly, he longed uh, for a more intimate relationship with the Savior. 
that he might, as he says in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. It is impossible for a carnal individual to understand the things of a spiritual God. In our carnality, we are never going to fully understand the things of God. The only way to know the things of God is by the Spirit of God, living and dwelling and moving within each and every one of us. The Spirit of God is given to humankind for a purpose. And it's not there to judge. It's not to condemn, but that we might know the things freely given to us of God. That these things are given freely accentuates the generosity of our God. Church, our God has so much for us. And I'm not a prosperity doctrine preacher. But God has so many blessings that he wants to just pour out on us. But so often we either don't follow after his word or we think that we've got to do it all our own way before we turn to him. Have you ever heard somebody say this? Well, I've done everything I can do. I guess I should pray now. Why don't we pray first and say, God, I don't understand it. But I'm bringing it to you. And I'm going to let you have your way in it. I'm going to let you direct me. I'm going to let you push, pull, tug, lift, hold down, whatever you need to do in my life to get me to where I need to be. And God, whatever it is, this is my desire. But God, whatever your desire is, I'm okay with that. You know, that's when God can really begin to work. The, the, the first aspect I want to look at is the greatness of God. Psalm chapter 139 depicts three aspects of the Spirit's great, uh, greatness that we normally refer to as the natural attributes of God. The first one is that He is all-knowing. Let me tell you, He knows everything. He knows the very thoughts and the very intents of your heart. So if you're thinking something... And you think you're hiding it? Guess what? God knows all about it. David defines uh, the omniscience of God several times in Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. He says, O Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You are acquainted with all my, my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, O Lord, that you know it all together. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The phrases clearly show David's conviction concerning the all-knowing attribute of God. He understood who God was. He understood, God, I, I can't hide one on you. You know, and, and believe me, David tried a few times. And then the prophet comes and begins talking, and it, it's like a light bulb that comes on in David's head. So, what was I thinking? I thought I could hide that from God? I was fooling myself. And that's exactly what happens. The omniscience of God is uh, comprehensive of the entire scope of mankind's existence. We need to realize he's omniscient. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and on the good. Proverbs 5.21 For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His knowledge also includes all of nature. You know, when we look at his knowledge, he's knowledgeable about you and I and everything that we do. But guess what? It goes beyond us. It's even the nature. Psalms 147, 4, he counts the number of stars. He calls them by name. He doesn't only have them numbered. He's got them all named. You know, 
I have a hard time remembering, remembering people's names. You know, I get into a group and, you know, face looks familiar, but can't remember the name. There's been a few times that I've, you know, somebody come, hey, Jim, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm doing great. You know, and I'll sit there. One time, I, I, I promise you, I remember this. I went to a 25th wedding anniversary. And a man walks up to me, talks to me like I'm an old lost friend, and I just went along with it. The whole time I'm going, who are you? He's reminding me of things and And you know, it ends up, when he finally walked away, I went over to the, to the couple that were selling, I said, who is that guy? Oh, that's... And then I, I felt like a fool because he and I had served together on different things and, and, and I, I just, I, I didn't recognize, I mean, I kind of recognize him, but I didn't, you know, all that. You know, I can't remember people's names, but God remembers not only your name, but all the name of the stars and every creature, everything out there, God remembers them by name. Matthew chapter 10 Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Not one. A sparrow that you could buy two for a penny. And, and they're important to God. The knowledge of the Spirit spans everything. Absolutely everything. Everything. God has complete knowledge of the total scope of human experiences. As we read in Proverbs 5.21, we understand that uh, people should be sure their ways are pleasing to God. The Spirit sees the affections, afflictions, hears the cries, and knows the sorrows of His people. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7 says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people and are in Egypt and have heard their cries because of their taskmasters and I know their sorrows. With God, there is no past, present, future. Everything is locked into the present. There is no time with God. You and I, we have time. 10 o'clock, we start Sunday school. So that means at a certain time, we need to leave. At 9.30, we start prayer. You know, half hour before every service, we start prayer. I just thought I'd throw that in. And then, you know, we, we, we just need to understand that, that with God, there is no past, present, future. It's all present. It's all here and now. Amen. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 through 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times uh, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsels shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I heard uh, Nathaniel um, Haney one time explaining a, a story kind of concerning this. He said that he was in a high-rise, if I remember right, he lived in the high-rise in New York City at the time, as a child. But he was in a high-rise uh, apartment. And it was around Thanksgiving when they were doing the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Day Parade. And he said, I remember watching the parade from this high-rise in downtown New York. And the parade went right under right by that apartment complex. He said, from his vantage point, I could see the beginning, I could see as it's happening, and I could see it all ending, all at the same time. He said, that is what God, you know, when we really begin to see what God is, God is back so far, but yet he's so close that he can see everything. And he sees it as it's from creation all the way to rapture and then into eternity. That is who our God is. He is everything. So he is omniscient. 
but he is everywhere. God is omnipresent. Omnipresent simply means that God is present everywhere at all times. No matter where you go, God is there. I remember years ago, first graduated from college, and I was a youth pastor in Sandusky, Ohio. And I took, and I was preaching on the omnis, uh, omnipresence of God. And I, I had drained, and they didn't know it, but I drained the baptismal tank. And it was up, you know, a little higher than what that is, but it was kind of off to the side. And I drained it. And I was preaching and I told him, I said, you know, even if this baptismal tank was a lead box, because a lead box, you cannot take x-rays inside of it. You know, if, if something's in the box and it's coated with lead, x-rays cannot penetrate and see. So as I'm talking, I walked up and I got right next to the, the baptistry. And I hadn't told him that I'd emptied it. And I said, so if I jump in here, and it was lined in lead, and I jumped over, and they, were, <gasps> they all thought I was going to get all wet, but I was smarter than them that day. But you see, the truth of the matter is, even if x-rays can't get in, God is already there. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. David knew that he could never escape the presence of God. If David went up to heaven, or if he made his bed in hell, the Spirit was there. William Evans states, God is everywhere in, in every place. His center is everywhere, his circumference nowhere. But the, this presence is a spiritual and not a material presence, yet it is a real presence. Okay? Did I go too fast? I see some of you going, let me read it again. God is everywhere in every place. His center is everywhere. His circumference is nowhere. In other words, there's nothing that gets out to the outer edges of He's, his circumference is nowhere. But this presence is a spiritual and not a material presence. Yet it is a real presence. Amen. Jeremiah said it this way in Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him? Says the Lord, do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. The omnipresence of God is a comfort to all those who fear him, love him, and seek to please him in their ways. He is always near and able to help his children. Under the government of God, no sinner can escape the eye of the judge. And the eye of the judge is God. Amen. Psalm 69, 5 says, O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. You know, we might be able to hide our sins from somebody else. But I remember growing up, one of my mom's favorite lines, be sure your sins will find you out. You see, we may be able to hide them from somebody else, but God knows all about you, everything you thought, everything you do, everywhere you go, everything you look at, you read, you watch on TV or the computers. God knows it all. You can be completely and totally alone. Nobody else around you. But let me tell you something. There is somebody else with you. And that is God. So what you're listening to, He's listening to. What you're watching, He's watching. It's the truth. Amen. The third thing. He is all powerful. 
God is all powerful. David said in Psalm 139 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That doesn't mean God's just going to scoop down and hold you with his right hand. The right hand, whenever you read about it in the scripture, means power. It refers to God's strength, his power. And he's saying, your power will hold me. David knew the Lord was all powerful. We call this omnipotence. Omnipotence is the attribute of God that enables him to do anything he desires to do. God's power has absolutely no boundaries. Job chapter 42 and verse 2 says in part, I know that you can do everything. Genesis 18, 14 says, Is nothing too hard for the Lord? You see, the nature of God is something that is wonderful. The nature of the Spirit is expressed in many ways. And we're only going to take a look at a few. But Hosea chapter 11 and verse 9 says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come with terror. God is holy. Well, some of you agree with that. God is holy. His holiness is prominent among his other moral attributes. Isaiah declared Jehovah to be the Holy One at least 30 times in his writings. We must also realize that God desires his people to be holy. How can we live an unholy life and expect to have a holy God living and dwelling with inside of us? Isaiah, no, excuse me, Psalm 99.9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Isaiah 57.15, For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a, a, a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. First Peter chapter 1 Verses 15 and 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am am holy. God was sinless, but he became sin for us in his sacrifice as atoning death on the cross. He became something that he was not to save you and I for what we were. We were full of sin, and he was sinless. He took that sin upon himself took it to a cross and bled and died upon that cross. But the good news is he rose again to give us that liberty so that one day we would be able to live forever with him. His willingness to die on the cross shows what value the Almighty places on holiness. He places great value on his children, but he wants them to be holy even as he is holy. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He is also love. 1 John 4, 16. It says, And we know, have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. 
Love is of God, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God, not only is love of God, but God is love, 1 John 4, 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Amen. The world likes to talk about love. But the love they're talking about isn't of God. They don't even comprehend that what true love actually is. Amen. 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Amen. The chapter closes with a, a commandment from God that he who loves God also must love his brothers. 1 John 4.21 And this commandment we have from him, and that he who loves God must love his brother also. We have a commandment, church. We need to love one another. You know, I, I like to say it this way. I heard it said a long time ago, and it makes sense. The Bible says I must love everybody. It doesn't say I have to like them. But I still have to love them. I don't have to like everything about somebody, but I still have to love them. I have to give the love of Christ. If the love of Christ is in me, I have to give it to them. It's going to flow through me to them. Amen. Praise God. Only in Christianity does the concept God is love fully exist. If you look at every other religion, the God of that religion requires you to do the sacrifice. In Christianity, God loved us so much that he became our sacrifice. And this is a thing that we must understand. The Spirit of God is the supreme experience of love available to mankind. When we compare John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16, we clearly see that God is willing to go farther than human comprehension can even dare to follow. God wants a relationship with us. Why? Because he loves us. You know, I hear people a lot of times, well, if God wanted that, why didn't he just make it so that, that you know, we, we had no other choice? Is that the kind of love you want? Simply because somebody has no other choice, they must love you or die? He gave us a spirit of free will so we could love him openly and freely and want to love him. There will be a punishment in the end for those that choose not to. But it will be their choice. And God is, you know, they, they say, well, well, why would God send anybody to hell? God's not sending anybody to hell. He came and made it possible so you can live for eternity in heaven. It is our choice. If I'm going to spend my eternity in the smoking area, that's my choice. Because God has already done the work so I don't have to be there. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would, would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
We cannot understand, comprehend, or even grasp God's abundant love, but we must be grateful for its reality to us and in us. Amen. He is also truth. John 16, 13 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Truth is pure and without error. Truth is truth. In this world today, I have heard it said, your truth may be a little different than my truth. It doesn't work that way. It's either truth or it's a lie. It's either real or it's false. Truth is truth. And one, if, I, if I'm preaching from the scripture and it's truth from the scripture and somebody comes up and says that's not my truth, let me tell you something, their truth is not truth. Their truth is a lie. And we need to understand this. Truth is pure and without error. Amen. There is no changing or shadow of turning with God. In him is truth. There is no lie. Romans 3, 4. Let God be true and every man a liar. And fourth, he is merciful. Oh, I'm so thankful that he is merciful. Amen. Psalms 103, verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Amen. That's as long as you can think, as far out as you can go. Amen. His mercy endures forever. When David sinned, he found that God's mercy opened the door of repentance and restoration. You can find that in Psalms 51, verses 1 through 19. In all 26 verses of Psalms 136, the psalmist expressed the mercy of God. Each verse contains the phrase, for his mercy endures forever. And I remember preaching from this portion of scripture. And I believe it was right here when I was still living in Ohio. And I remember how as I was preaching it, the Spirit of God just began to fall. And I, I, I could just imagine as David was writing Psalms 136 and just the Spirit of God began to dwell up inside of him. And at, at the end of each verse, he'd just write, for his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. And he's probably thinking, I don't deserve this, but his mercy endures forever. We need to understand that the mercies of God endures forever. The mercy of God was not an afterthought, but its a refrain dominates the thoughts that precede it. God's mercy is an all-consuming thought that prompts praise and gratitude from his people. You and I, when we begin to think about the mercies of God, we ought to begin to praise him. We ought to begin to worship him and just begin to think, God, you did this for me. If nobody else wants to accept it, God, I want to accept it. I want to take your mercies. I want to believe in your mercies. Because God, you did it for me. Amen. God's mercy is an all-consuming thought that prompts praise and gratitude from his people. Psalms 136, 26. Oh, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his mercies endure forever. David never tried, tired of acknowledging the mercies of God. Psalms 86, 15. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Amen. The mercy of God is pure and holy. God's intent in mercy is not to protect the sinner, but to forgive the repentant sinner. 
His mercy is there. And, and, and as we come to him in a, a spirit of repentance, his mercy just washes our sins away. He just wipes them out. And I love the way the scripture says he puts it as far as the east is from the west. Now, if you don't understand that concept, let me explain it to you like this. He didn't say he put it as far as the north is from the south. Because if I leave here and I start heading north, there is going to come a point in my journey where all of a sudden I'm going to be heading south. Once I hit that North Pole and I keep going in the same direction, I'm now heading south because North and South meet each other. But East and West never meet. If I leave here and I start heading West, I can go all the way around this globe. And when I end up right back here, I've only headed West. I've never never turned around. So they never meet. So as far as the east is from the west, guess what? It doesn't stop. And there is the beauty of all of what God wants to do. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly, did you hear that? Abundantly pardon. Amen. He's just going to keep pouring pardon and mercy on us as we continue to seek him. Amen. Then I look at some of the manifestations of God. The Spirit of God makes himself known in numerous ways. Here are four ways that God has made himself known. The first one is as creator. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. I love this verse. It sets the whole foundation of the scripture. In the beginning, God. You could just stop right there. And you could preach. You could live a victorious life right there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One of the very first ways the Spirit of God manifested himself in our known world was as its creator. As creator, he brought all things into existence. Genesis 1-2 says in part, And the Spirit of God was hoovering over the face of the waters. We stand amazed at the things God created. How much more awestruck should we be in the very presence of the Creator? When we come into the very presence of the Creator, we ought to be awestruck. You know, I, I have seen people, I've grown up in this. I've seen other people that have grown up in this, and they get an arrogant spirit. And they think that because they were born and raised in this, that somehow they have earned extra brownie points with God. Let me tell you something. We were all, every one of us, born into sin. And it was because of God and all that God has done for us. Just that I can repent and I can live this life. So when I come in the presence of my Creator, oh God, I love you, Jesus. God, you have done so much for me. We have no life except that He gives it. We have no existence except that He, he brings us into being. The second one is the Word. John 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Jump down to verse 14. 
And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As the word, the creator, became flesh and dwelt among us, his created beings. He dwelt among us, his created being. Amen. First, or John chapter 1, verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, John was born before Jesus, okay, in the flesh. As the Spirit, Jesus, however, was eternal. And this is what John was speaking of. God manifested himself as a word who became flesh and dwelt among his own creation in order to redeem humankind. His love is the reason for this manifestation. He loved us so much that he came to redeem us. To redeem us, he lived righteously, suffered death, and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the evil hands that held them, then rose on the third day. He was willing to do all of this because of his great love for his entire creation. Amen. The third one is, he is the comforter. A sample of scriptures from the Gospel of John reveals the promises of Jesus Christ concerning the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. And I'm going to go through these quickly, so if you're trying to write them down, just write the, the reference and look them up later. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. 14, verses 16 through 18, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that ye may... Let me get my glasses on. That he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name... He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John chapter 15, verses 26 through 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have, have been with me from the beginning. John 16, verses 7 through 11. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. John 16, verses 13 and 14. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare, and declare it to you. You see, studying these verses from the book of John will help us to better understand the identity, the source, and the purpose of the Comforter. And the final one is he came like a dove. Matthew 3.16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Also in the book of Luke, we read how the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. This was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit for yet another purpose. It was an assurance for John the Baptist that he was right 
to be declaring that Jesus was to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. When we consider all these things, this is enough to cause a person to bow their knees in, in humble adoration of God. Our God, who created all things, is willing to dwell in hearts, the hearts of his creation. He is all-knowing. He is everywhere present at all times. He is all-powerful. And he is, all in, he is our all in all. What a mighty God we serve. Church, when we get into the, the house of God, when we get into our times of prayer, when we get into our times of worship, we need to remember who it is that we are worshiping. This isn't just some idol that somebody thought up in their mind and then whittled out a stone or, or wood or carved out a stone or formed out of some gold and made into a golden image. He is our creator. He is the one that created you and I. And that, if for no other reason, deserves our praise, deserves our worship. You know, a lot of times we get so hung up on what he isn't doing for us that we forget to praise him for what he has done for us. Amen. We need to begin to praise and worship him in spirit and in truth completely and totally. Amen.